Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Holon IQ 2022 Global Impact Summit. My name is Brennan Baxter. I'm the Vice President of the Health Division at Holon IQ, and I'm delighted today as part of our uh, Africa Summit to be joined by Sangu Dell, the CEO of CarePoint. Sangu, welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you, Sangu. So just um, for a bit of context today, we're going to be talking to Sangu about CarePoint, the, uh, the business he is the CEO of, and we're also going to be discussing the wider African market before looking at some potential trends for the future of healthcare in Africa. But just to get us started, Sangu, I'd love to hear from you about, uh, first of all, for the participants in the Global Impact Summit, a bit of context about what the business is, uh, where, where it operates, and how it kind of functions, and then maybe you could also tell us a bit about why your route into healthcare and your route into uh, founding this business. Yeah, no, it's it's. Um, I'm happy to tell you about CarePoint. So CarePoint is a tech-forward healthcare system, right? With our, our big uh, 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 vision, we say, look, we're, we're going out, we're building Africa's healthcare future. So we currently are doing this through a three-pronged approach, um, a technology enabled approach, a patient-centered approach, and a skilled network approach. Um, so we have, uh, we currently have a skilled network of 65 hospitals and clinics, serving 1 million patients in Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, and we have big ambitious goals to serve 100 million Africans by 2030. Well, and Sangu, it's, um... It'd be great to talk about the mix of digital and physical in your business because 65 hospitals across a, a geography of that sort of range is a considerable enterprise in itself. But it's interesting to to, to kind of hear about your ambitions to also, uh, I, su I suppose, build out the digital element as well. Yes, no, absolutely. So our approach is a is a brick and click approach, yeah. right? Where the idea is we can deliver healthcare to you um, anytime, anywhere, right? And so it's, it's, it, this is what happens when you design your healthcare solutions around the patient, right? right, around the customer, because you think about what their needs are and how do we deliver a solution that it's, you know, that incorporates their needs and that's designed specifically to address their needs. And so if you look at the customer of today, the customer of today is on the move, on the go. They want efficiency, right? They want something that is uh, that has great value, right? They want something that is, um, that's not going to waste their time. And so that's, that's what we're able to offer with the digital tools. If I take the way we've designed our telemedicine product as a case study, um, our telemedicine product is quite innovative because it's not just you doing a virtual consultation like how you can see me on the screen. Yeah. Um, but we'll actually send lab text to you wherever you are, GPS enabled, take your blood sample um, or, or other samples that are needed, send it to the nearest lab within our network, um, you know, digitally transmits the results to you. And, uh, and then we'll have your, your pharmaceutical drugs and products delivered to you wherever you are, right? And so it's, it's designed holistically from that perspective. Of course, one of the things we're, we're very, very excited about um, and that we're, we're doing a lot of R&D and is ways in which we can start leveraging emerging technologies. How can we use wearables? How can we build on and develop certain algorithms that can help us really move into the realm of preventive care? Because the goal ultimately um, is wellness, right? The goal is to ensure that, that our customers are in perfect health. And, and that starts with um, making sure they don't need to get into the hospital in the first place. And Sangu, maybe you can elaborate a bit on how it works in terms of the model, because obviously as a provider and operator of acute facilities in lots of different uh, geographies, how, how do you actually access patients in that kind of preventative fashion that you've just described in terms of um, having early interactions with people on their healthcare journey? How, how, how do you sort of, what, what's your sort of point of entry to that part of a, uh, of a care pathway? Yes, yeah, so um, I'll tell you about what we're doing now, and then I'll tell you about some of our plans for the future, right? Sure. What we're doing now is um, we're engaging our customers um, in digital platforms. We're building a digital community around wellness. So that's what we've been doing in terms of disseminating information, um, uh, 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 myth-busting, um, sharing of 
um, tips and healthy habits and really encouraging people um, um, digitally online. But what we're the, the next steps and what we're doing from an R&D perspective and some products will be launching out. Um, there's certain products we're going to do where we, we can partner with businesses and even insurance companies, right, who are both incentivized to want their employees um, to be healthy and productive, right? And we'll be able to then, um, you know, use certain innovative products like wearables and other devices that can give us certain data, right, up front where we can monitor that data to then know if there are certain anomalies here and there. So there, there are interesting ways that technology today offers us tools, mm -hmm. right, to help us monitor um, the health conditions of folks and to then be able to take steps early on in that journey rather than wait for things to get complicated or for things to, to you know to get worse before you now have to come to the hospital where you have higher costs and so we're thinking about about health from that full holistic perspective right and are working on products that will be able to actually ensure um that you 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 know we win as you win from a health perspective and Sangu, in terms of the challenges of operating uh, an organization in multiple countries, multiple regulatory frameworks, multiple government systems that you'll have to kind of deal with, how, how do you go about managing that from a kind of organizational perspective? It's, it has its challenges. But what I always say is, um, you know, this idea that the, the, there's a clear imperative and a clear advantage in terms of economies of scale and scope to build in a Pan-African business, because the challenges are so similar across these borders. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, in spite of, yes, there are language differences and some regulatory differences and differences here and there, but at the end of the day, a heart surgery is a heart surgery, right? It's not as if the heart of an Egyptian is different from the heart of a Nigerian. A heart surgery is a heart surgery. So yeah. there are so many places where we have synergies, right? The same amoxicillin that I'm giving to somebody in Kenya is the same amoxicillin I can give somebody in Ghana. And so if you think about it, aggregating demand is also going to allow us to actually be able to reduce the cost of care. So there's so many areas where, where there's value creation from having scale and being able to leverage these economies of scale and these economies of scope. And you know, a lot of times I get this, you know, I get this question around um, uh, uh, why build something that's Pan-African versus maybe just stick to one country. And, and I always laugh and say, look, th th this is not the first time these sorts of skepticism has, has arose. The same thing happened during the telcos. When the telcos in the 90s were building out, people said the same thing. And we know what the success story has been. The telcos were successfully able to build a Pan-African business, and they were able to enjoy very, very healthy, in fact, mind-blowing EBITDA margins in excess of 50% in the case of MTN, for example. And so I think that there's a clear... Um, uh, compelling business imperative uh, for building this business and other businesses on a Pan-African basis. Uh, Pan-Africa gives you 1.3 billion people uh, from a market size and perspective. And, and given the fragmentation of a lot of African nations where you have some populations, 4 million, 6 million, 2 million, you can build a viable, um, massive business in, if you are just in a country that has 2 million, 4 million, 6 million people. So you necessarily have to go to, have to go Pan-African, right? Yeah, and it makes a whole bunch of sense in terms of kind of uh, the ability to kind of build a business of scale. Maybe you could touch upon a bit about the kind of complexities too as well in terms of the, I suppose, the, the differences in... Um, price points in different markets or the uh, the way that you will maybe have to tailor your services and um, how, how do you sort of adapt your model to different markets or, or where, where do you play? Do you, do you try and keep a uniform approach uh, uh, where your brand is known in, as a certain particular sort of uh, level of, of care? Yeah, you know, interesting questions. And, and these are the, the challenges we grapple with on a daily basis. So what we do is there's seven things that we clearly will standardize. So processes, um, uh, cl setting clinical guidelines will pick the highest, most stringent globally and, and apply it across the board. Um, so, so things that we're doing around quality, around patient care, around operations, SOPs, all those things are standardized, right? Because they can. Then, of course, you have your, nu your nuances, your local idiosyncrasies, your challenges even with, I'll tell you, we're, you know, we're trying to build these uniform tech systems. Language. 
<laughs> yes, you know, it it, it, you, it sounds simple until you have called something, and you have to think about English and French and Arabic, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then yeah. suddenly, it you know, the complexity just just you know increases by 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 a multiple. Um, and then there are different ways of doing things also because if you think about it, right? When we're designing these tech systems, ultimately, we are building it on the because what I always say is, what is tech? Tech is just a way for us to um, automate and make more efficient a lot of these processes. But there was a world before tech, quote unquote, before the tech that, that we think of. There was, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we still had healthcare facilities. We still had all these businesses running, right? What the technology enables us to do. It enables us to automate a lot of these processes and it gives us a lot of rich data that can inform a lot of our decision making. Okay. Um, but what's but for that to happen, you need to first of all make sure that you understand your process, your workflows, all those different things. And there you have some cultural nuances there as well, right? Where the way certain things may be done in Egypt might be different from how we we'll do things in Kenya. So those are some of the complexities. But all in, I think that the overriding factor is. Uh, we've built uh, an, an incredible culture, and that culture, um, which puts patient first, right, is is what draws everyone together across the borders to make sure that at the end of the day we're in service for the patient. Right, we want to make sure that we can deliver the best quality care, right, in a cost-effective manner to be able to make sure that we're we're getting large masses of of, of Africans healthy. And, and talking about uh, a shared culture, obviously, I'm interested to know about the rebranding of the business, which uh, took place relatively recently. And I just wanted to understand what your thinking was behind that and the, the rationale and, and how that is going. Look, it's very simple. Um, if I tell you, hey, I work at CarePoint versus, hey, I work at Africa Health Holdings, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you can see why we made the name change. When we first had Africa Health Holders, it was a placeholder name, right? We said we had set up the legal entity and it was a placeholder name. And the idea was to change the name all along, but never got around to it. And eventually I realized, look, we're actually getting quite big. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to uh, we need to make this name change ASAP before we get too big where we didn't, you know, uh, we wouldn't be able to make the name change as 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 efficiently. Um, and so that's when, you know, we decided CarePoint was already one of the brands we we're using in Nigeria. Um, and so we decided to use that name uh, for the entire business because it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's a, it's a nice name. It's intuitive in terms of what we do, right? CarePoint, you know, care you can trust. Um, and uh, it, it, it reflects a focus on care for the patient. And, and in terms of how you go about building that culture, um, you know, when you when you do have a sort of geographically disparate uh, organization, what, what, what are the sort of methods that you use to kind of create a brand or create a sense of unity amongst your uh, your team and your your colleagues in different countries? So they feel a connection with uh, yeah. often, often the kind of colleagues who are remote and uh, physically. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, it starts with uh, recruiting. <laughs> you, we, we make sure that we we write. I mean, at the end, there was culture, right? Culture is how people be, behave when no one is watching. That's culture, right? And um, and how they'll behave when no one is watching. A lot of it is going to be the sort of people we hire. And so, right from recru recruiting is the most important part because that's where you really need to make sure that you're finding people who will be the right cultural fit. Right. Then once they come into the organization, how do we build and sustain that culture? Um, and we, we do that in so many ways to reinforce the culture. Right. We uh, there's so many events we organize. The benefit is even though we're in different countries, technology affords us to be able to connect. And so we're constantly connecting, um, working. We don't work in silos. We work across borders um, and that reinforces the culture constantly moving around also, especially now that where um, you know COVID has has you know has been has has largely been managed. We're able we're going back to travel, so we're able to move around. We recently just came off a week in Egypt where we brought all our the entire team over to Cairo, 
um, one to celebrate our new our expansion into Egypt, but but more importantly, for us to have a retreat and a leadership summit where we're all aligned on on the growth initiatives for the future, um, and all those sorts of things help reinforce culture. Yeah, and and in terms of expansion and growth, uh, obviously you you raised money earlier this year. Um, I think it was it 10, 10 million US dollars you you raised. Yes, we've raised. Yes, we we did in a pre B, which we've um, we've we've now raised a total of about thirty million dollars. Yeah, I, and it'd be great to sort of like obviously you've talked about entry into the Egyptian market and and other sort of expansion plans, but it'd be great to maybe broaden the the discussion about um, from CarePoint, but also for the the wider opportunity in the market and help people participate in this summit to understand. You know what? What what are you planning to use those funds for, and where do you see the opportunity? Yeah, no. Look, there's um, the opportunity is so huge. I'm already back in the market fundraising <laughs> for yeah. our next round, right? Because I mean, when you think about it, right? As a continent, we have we're what 15% of global population, yet we represent 26% of global disease burden, mm -hmm. and we only have 3% of global healthcare workers. That is a wicked problem to have, mm -hmm. right? But technology offers us a huge opportunity um, to be able to leverage uh, things like telemedicine, to be able to leverage um, AI and machine learning to actually help us um, uh, allocate our doctor resources more efficiently, right? So that doctors are not spending or wasting time on administrative duties and can better focus all their time on clinical hours. And then we can help automate some of these processes and help use technology to actually democratize access um, in places where it's difficult to get a doctor. And we started doing that. We started actually building these tech enabled micro clinics where we put virtual doctor offices in areas where it's difficult to get certain specialists. And then we can have our specialists sit in Accra or Nairobi or Cairo, and then they can do a virtual consultation with those, with those, with those patients. And in terms of the, the, the areas you mentioned a couple of them already, but in terms of the opportunity in terms of do you, do you look for centers of urban populations or do you look for um areas where there's kind of more demographics uh, that support private pay um uh, ability i mean what is the guiding principle in terms of where you want to be yeah so i mean look if we look at the healthcare market in africa as a whole you're looking at a market that's about 259 billion dollars right half of which is um I'd say about 45% is government, mm -hmm. um, another 45% is private pay, and then the 10% is um, insurance and nonprofits. Um, and so it's actually a much larger market than most people assume, right? When you mm -hmm. think about it from that perspective, it's, it's quite size. I mean, quarter of a trillion dollars is, is quite the size. Um, but with respect to, um, sorry, I just blanked on the question. <laughs> I, I, I suppose, you know, with, with all that opportunity and all that sort of potential to go after, how do you prioritize or triage the the areas that you want to focus on? Um, is, is it driven by the availability of sites? Is it driven by the weight of demographics or, or, or where yeah. wealth? Yeah. Yeah, great. So, so first of all, I, I want to let you uh, explain that it's a, it's a large, massive market, right? You have the healthcare market in Africa is about $259 billion. So that's almost quarter of it. That's quarter of a trillion dollars, um, of which about 45% is government, 45% is private pay, and then you have 10% that's insurance and nonprofits. Um, and so in terms of, so the first thing we look at is the addressable market within that, right? So we're going after, uh, regions that have a strong addressable market, especially in the, in the private pay and insurance segment. We're also going after countries where the demographics, you know, so if you look at the countries we're in, your Egypt, your Kenya, your Ghana, your Nigeria, you have lots of favorable demographics, you have strong populations. I mean, you have, what, 33 million in Ghana, 200 million in Nigeria, 100 million plus in Egypt, and, and over 50 million in Kenya, right? So, so these are all countries with strong populations, with strong economic growth, um, um, at least historically speaking, you have your macroeconomic challenges here and there today. But when you when you when you take a longer term perspective, these are these are all countries that we feel very good and confident about when we when we look out over. You know, if I if I take a uh, a long term horizon, I think these countries, their health sectors, will do extremely well. 
and 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 there's there's real demand there's very real demand for better products in in healthcare and and just on that point about demand um and where you sort of position your products or your services in terms of i suppose pricing um so like where would you say you kind of look uh to place yourself in the kind of um uh, the, the kind of spectrum that, that, that you could play in in this kind of market with vast disparities in income? Yeah. So so a couple of interesting things I'll say. The first is I, I think we, we play in the middle here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, being cost effective is so important for us and, and yeah. we're very focused on making care affordable. But within that, if we unpack that a bit, we actually have a bit of a hybrid model. So what we do is we, we'll have some of our facilities in the very fancy places and we'll charge them a lot of money because that allows us to subsidize care because we also have facilities in the very poor areas, right? So we have yeah. a number of facilities in low income areas. And in fact, if I think, if I look at the numbers, the last analysis we did, 47% of the patients we see are low income and we see a million patients a year, mm. right? And we're, we're able to deliver care to the low income brackets because we have this cross subsidization hybrid model um, within our facilities and with our pricing. Um, there's some facilities, for example, where um, we will have, we've been quite innovative, we'll have like a, a VIP um, package, right? So it allows me, so let's say um, cost of care should be, for it to make sense, might be $200. For it, for me to make it affordable, I might price it at $100, and then I might have a VIP package for three, 400 bucks. Um, and that yeah. VIP package would be maybe you come, you, you, you have a fancier lounge you sit in with, coffee and pastries and then you get to see a doctor immediately so because that guy is because i'm going to charge that guy 400 bucks that now enables me to be able to reduce that cost of care to 100 dollars for the others who ordinarily without that model may have had to pay 200 dollars. right so it's mm-hmm. being innovative and figuring out how we can leverage willingness to pay and, and cross subsidize um, to ensure that we're, we're delivering care in a cost-effective manner and making care affordable and Sangu, if we were to, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the the near future and obviously uh, having raised 30 million and going back to the markets to raise more, you obviously have big plans for the future. And w- what I'm really interested to know is uh, how you think the, the market that you operate in, so not just CarePoint itself, but the market uh, more broadly, is, is set to kind of develop over, let's say, the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. What's What does the future of healthcare in Africa look like to you? Well, the first, the, to, you know, before I even think of what's the future of healthcare in Africa, what's the future of Africa going to look like? I'll tell mm-hmm. you, Africa is now 1.3 billion people. We're going to be 2.5 billion by 2050. One in four people globally will be African. 70% of the world's youth will be in Africa. Those are staggering numbers, staggering <laughs> numbers, right? It means that we are literally going to have over a billion babies born in Africa over the next two decades and change, right? The vast super majority of the world's youth are going to be in Africa. So, I mean, think about what that means. And, and, and let me give you some, some relative context for you to, to understand that in most parts of the world, birth rates are below replacement level, okay? Yeah. 1.7 in the US, 1.4 in Europe, 1.1 in China. In Japan, they're not even having sex anymore. Like it's like, no, I'm telling you, it's a crisis. It's actually an existential crisis in Japan. Yeah. I mean, birth rates are so deplorably low. In Africa, birth rate per woman is 5.9. 5.9. And so that's where you're actually going to see um, the growth. And and, and that's where you see demographics. And the big question, of course, is how do we ensure this is a demographic dividend and not a demographic disaster? And the answer, right? partly lies in healthcare. We need to be able to deliver healthcare systems that can ensure that we have a healthy and productive citizenry that will ensure that they'll be able to power um, uh, the continent to make sure that we're a success story and not not a fiasco. Yeah, I mean, as you say, the kind of statistics around that are quite just cr- incredible, really, and you know, changes the shape of the continent, but also the world in terms of the, the the makeup but as you say it's the um you know there's a, we'll put pressure or, or create massive capacity issues for for healthcare providers 
And when you look across the, uh, I suppose, your contemporaries, the other people playing in the space, the the funding that's coming into the market, do you think it's keeping pace all, enough all, already? Or do you think yeah. more more capital, more entrepreneurial energy, more expertise needs to come into the sector? Um, what we're seeing is just a drop in the ocean. Um, re- you know, the the funding and the attention that's coming in relative to demand and what's needed, drop in the ocean. You yeah. need a lot more capital, a lot more focus, a lot more expertise, a lot more attention. And COVID warned us. We saw what happened in COVID, the consequences for not having an effective healthcare system. And uh, ahead of the next pandemic, we, we, we have a, a short window to really ensure that we build and invest in highly effective, high quality health systems. Yeah, well, Sangri, I think that takes us to the end of our allotted time. And I think it's a great point to finish on, because as you say, there's a prime opportunity now to kind of make improvements, investments and develop systems globally. But, but obviously in Africa, I think there's a particular demand. So I just want to finish by thanking you on behalf of all the people participating in the Hull and IQ uh, Global Impact Summit. It's been fascinating to hear about CarePoint and, and your views and experience of the African healthcare market. Oh, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you and all the best. Thank you.